You got him on live now? All right, Dennis, you're live. I need somebody to tell me I'm alive sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I travel a lot, you know, and never thought I'd ever do that, but I do. You put it closer. And uh, walk in front of the funny TV. thing about it, you, you think you have put your life here. figured out what God's going to do with it, and he gives it to you in some chaos. I think we kind of laugh about it sometimes, you know. Sometimes we don't see the humor in it. But, you know, I, as I, as I travel, you know, I hear a lot of people talk about judgment, judgment, you know. But do we really understand what judgment is? And, and the thing about judgment is, you know, the scripture is really plain about it. And uh, I think we're fools if we don't judge. And, and the reason is because it says that when God's judgments are in the land, he said the inhabitants will learn righteousness. So if you take that right reversed, if God's judgment is not in the land, the inhabitants will not learn what is right. So it's a very important thing. Uh, as ministries of all of us, I, we're subject to, we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't care if anybody judges us. Amen? Because I believe it's a day we're walking in that God is bringing an integrity ministry. The one, my, I had a, I had a teacher one time in, in scripture that really taught me how to study, put me under her arms when I first began to walk in the word of God. And she told me one thing that's always stuck with me my whole life. We should live our life as in a fishbowl where everyone can see it. Amen? I mean, I mean if, and then it says, know ye not that you shall judge the angels. So judgment is a very important part of God because without that, we don't know if we're right or wrong. Because, you know, in myself, I can deceive myself to thinking I'm right. And I've seen many times I've been wrong. But as God began to show me that, and I opened my life to that, I opened my life to be judged by anybody. And, and I think we're fools if we do not. You know, when it says judge angels, it means to judge the message. So as I speak here today, I welcome you to judge this message. And I think you're a fool if you don't. Amen? And what do you judge it with? You judge it with the character of God versus the other. The character of God always rules. And I'm going to tell you something about the character of God. The character of God is never for the flesh. It's against the flesh. Amen? So for us to judge flesh, we are completely right in it. Amen? <clears throat> and I'm talking about, I'm not talking about going out there hammering people. I'm talking about the carnal nature of man. Amen? Judgment begins where? At the house of the Lord. I am the house of God. So I judge myself. And I keep myself open to that. And that's, you know, that's, and I hear that all over. You know, people say, well, we're not supposed to judge. No, that's not right. Scripture tells us plainly to judge, to measure, to discern every single thing that is coming in our lives. Amen? And we are to. It's very vital. Matter of fact, we, if we do not do that, then we don't learn the right standing in God. And I don't know about y'all, but I want to be right in the standing of God. The voice of man don't affect me. Can you hear me? The scripture says, fear not man. So the voice of man I could care less about. Because the voice I need to have reverence to is the voice of God, not the voice of man. So, you know, I want to tell you something this way. Fear no man. And the man you have to fear most of all is you. Amen? Because this little thing right up here is what's programming you. Amen? Amen. And that's what I was telling my daughter this morning, you know. There is many voices that comes to us in all directions. Many voices. And as they come to us, they direct our paths. But the bottom line to everything, when every, all the dust is settled and everything is, is, is cleared away, what does God say about it? Don't matter what my vision's telling me. It don't matter what my circumstances is telling me. 
What has God said about it? Amen? That's the bottom line. And that's where we got to keep ourselves. What has God said about this? If you'd like to, if you would, would you pull up Revelation chapter 6? I'm going to speak to you about the four horsemen of Revelation. And I don't know how far I'll get because there's a lot here. I mean, there is a lot here. Uh, the thing about the revelation of, of, of John, I want you to always remember that John is not speaking about an end time event. He's not speaking about everything that's going to happen in the future. When John addressed this revelation in the very beginning of chapter 1, John said that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ written unto the seven churches that are scattered out through Asia. Now, I, I want to really, really focus on that. That was the beginning of the revelation, and it ends in chapter 21 with the same revelation. So all through the middle, the beginning, the middle, and the end is still the same revelation. It's to the church. It's not to the world. It is to the church. And it's really important that we understand that. Because in the understanding of that, we'll get a right concept of what he's revelating in us. Amen? How many of you love Revelation? Huh? <laughs> I'm going to speak about something, and you may not like it so much when you see what it entails. Amen? Because I promise you, it is a progressive thing. This is the order that revelation comes. The four horses are, is the revelation. How many of you know horses speaks of strength? Speaks of war? It speaks of durability? It speaks of swiftness and power and strength. If you look in the Roman days, it was their horses that carried them to the battle. Amen? In Revelation chapter 1, as we begin to read, and he said, I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. One interpretation, and this is what I want you to understand, those seals are being opened in you. This is where it's sealed up at. It does no good for me to see it out here. The revelation is in you. One, one interpretation or definition of this seal being open is the I watched as the lamb broke the first seal notice the word open and broke same word notice in order for these seals to be open something has to be broke <laughs> see we want these to be open but we don't want the broke It's in your brokenness that God begins to discover to you who he is and who you are. Because see, if you're not broken from your pride, from your selfishness, guess what? You'll never see what's really in you. Because man, literally, hey, I would be satisfied to go to work, come home, take care of my family, and that'd be it. That's the man in me. I'm satisfied with that. But God ain't. Can you hear me? So in order for these seals to be open, there first is going to be a breaking. And in that breakingness, God opens the seals. The seals is within us. It's not outside us. God is unsealing what's been sealed in us since the beginning or before the foundations of the world. Amen? Now, I believe everything in Scripture is God. God created a foolproof plan. There's no direction you can go that you can walk away from where God is. Can you hear that? Evil, dark, I don't care. It come about because of God. And it's designed for a specific purpose of God. There ain't nobody in control of anything except God. And if you'll ever get that concept in your life, you'll get free. 
And that way, when tornadoes hit your life, it turns. I mean, you know what a tornado is. You know, in the book of in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel said, "I seen a whirlwind," which means a tornado. Go up. How I many of you know what a tornado does? You ever been behind a tornado? It relocates everything. <laughs> Amen. It's God, the tornado. He relocates everything in our life. He disassembles so that he can assemble. Does that make sense? Okay, so we know that the first the seal has to be broken to be opened. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder. How I many of you know every time that God speaks, some only hear thunders and some hear a clear word? The children of Israel, when Moses went up into the mountain, they said it thundered when God spoke. But Moses heard a clear word from God of how to build the tabernacle. But the rest of the people only heard thunder. Do you know it's the same today? There's a people that is hearing a clear, defined, definite word from God, and some people are only hearing thunder. Amen? Come. And look, this word, I look, a one interpretation says, come and see. But in the original, as it was originally written, it simply says, come. And that word is not sent to John. Can you hear me? That word is summoning the horses. That makes a big difference in that scripture. Because see... John was standing there. John didn't have to go anywhere. He was in the presence of God at that time. Come means he's summoning these horses. And I looked and there before me was a white horse. See there? Its rider held a bow. And he gave a crown. And he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. In other words, he's not quitting until he does it. Now watch. Here's your, here's your revelation. God first shows up in your life enlightening you. That's what white represents. Illuminate. It's revelation. The first thing God's calling forth is revelation. Amen? Enlightenment. I see. God's opening our understanding. We're beginning to see. Right? Right? And, we, and, and how many of you know that's a great time in your life? I mean, you think, wow, where can I go from here? Man, I heard you so plain, God. You've been illuminating. I've seen things I've never seen before. And we're running around shouting the hallelujahs and the glories because of everything we've just seen at what God has revealed to us, right? And, and we, sin, we tend to think, uh, hey, this is all of it. Now all I got to do is just sit back and enjoy this total enlightenment. Amen. Let's read a little bit farther. When the Lamb, notice who's opening these. Notice who's breaking these seals. It ain't the devil. Come on. It's not the devil breaking this. It's not the devil breaking you. It's the Lamb breaking these seals in us. And if the lamb's breaking the seals in us, I can guarantee you what's going to come forth out of that breaking is life. That's one thing I do know. I may not understand it in the breaking, but I know eventually it will lead to life. Amen? Where was I at? Second. And I heard the second living creature say, come. See, that's, it. that's the right context. Come. He's summoning the next horse. We thought, oh, glory to God, I'm going to stay in Revelations all my life. I'm, I got this great opening. You know, I've searched for these truths my whole life. I found them, glory to God. I found home. Amen? Watch this next horse. Come, red horse. Listen, then another horse came out, a fiery red one. And listen to what he does. It, its rider was given power 
to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other to whom was given a large sword. Wow. Wow. Red horse. Fiery horse. That's what it means. It's an interpretation of God's consuming fire. Every, every revelation you will receive will be tried by fire. See the progressing? It ain't the devil riding this red horse again. It ain't the devil taking your peace from you. Is it? These horses ain't coming out of the dark realm. They're coming out of the heavens. John is in the heavens receiving this word. Amen? So the red horse, if you look at it, any part in scripture represents fiery red, the lake of fire that burns with brimstone. It's a purging fire. It's a testing fire. Everything that you are will be tested and seasoned by fire. So what comes with revelation? Testings. What comes with revelation? Your peace being taken. Everything that you have found peace in in this earth and you have found yourself comforted in in this earth will be taken. Because see, his kingdom is not this earth. All of your prosperity that you're so proud of, all of the things that you think is so grand in this world, you will find yourself not having peace in it. Because those things cannot give us peace. We find peace in God's life. Amen? And that's what the red flaming horse does. It takes peace. Not only does it take peace, it comes with a sword to take your head off. <laughs> Jesus said, I come and I have no place to lay my head. Well, Jesus is going to find a place to lay his head. As Goliath, this is not the sword here. I, I, I thought it was really neat. One commentary said, this wasn't a sword of a knife like a sacrifice. This was a sword like David took Goliath's head off with. Can you hear that? In other words, it dethroned Goliath. Me and you have to be dethroned off the humanity that we are. Our carnal nature is not going into the heavens, people. I don't care how much you dress it up, how much you anoint it, and how much you pray over it. It is not going into the heavens. And I don't care how much you preach over him. He can't come. Thank God he can't come. So it was given to him to have the earth to kill each other. To him was given a large sword. And the lamb broke the third seal. Look at the progressing here. We have revelation of light, enlightenment. The next thing that comes behind that, everything that you think you know will be tried by fire. So immediately when you get revelation of who you are, guess what? Something's going to come in your life to tell you not who you are. Oh, you're a son of God? You have power? Here, take this. See if you can get power over this. Amen? Yeah. Let your mind run like a wild ass, and all of a sudden you think, can I have power over this? With every single thing that God brings in, there is a testing, there's a trying time. And the Lamb opened the third seal. So we have enlightenment, revelation. Now we have the fire proving the word. Taking our peace out of everything that we have that is not of God. Amen? Now the next verse. The Lamb opened the third seal. Progressing. Amen? And by the way, I see hoof prints all over us. These horses are riding within us, people. Amen. And they will ride in us until he conquers. Amen. When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come. Again, right interpretation. See, he's calling the horses forth in our life. Where's this happening at? John's in the spirit, right? How many of you know where revelation comes from? Don't come outside you. 
So though someone may be speaking, when you truly hear what he's speaking, where do you hear it at? Right here. John is no different. He's not seeing a vision or a revelation outside himself. That was one of the greatest things that God told me about the book of Revelations. He said, John is having the same experience as you do when you have revelation. It's within him. This is all developing and happening right in him at this time. Amen? And I heard the third electric come, and I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Now, boy, we want to call that one the devil, don't we? Amen? This is the black horse. This has got to be the demons. This is the devil, right? He said, a black horse, and its rider holding a pair of scales in his hands. Man. Then I heard what sounded as a voice among the four labor kids saying, two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do no damage to the oil and the wine. Amen. The blackness. All of a sudden, we have revelation. The white horse, illumination, revealing, unveiling. Then after everything's unveiled, it's set in the fire of God for the proving, for the investment in us. And all of a sudden, our peace is taken. And immediately when our peace is taken, Sean, we find dark days ahead. Amen? Amen? You take your peace in some of the things you believe, and if you don't believe it's black hole shores up, every one of us ought to know this because we've walked it and lived it already. Every time my peace is taken in something that I thought I was so stable in, there's a dark day comes in my life. Now watch what the dark day does, though. It says that it has a balance in him. It takes a night, it, it don't take just a day, it takes a day and a night to make one. So the dark, gloomy things that comes in our life, there's a purpose in it. And it's a progressive thing. Amen? So the black, it means the echo what it is, dark days. Christianity, just because you believe, you know, people used to say this, they condemn you because you're not always prospering in what they call prosperity or what you're or you're healthy because they think all Christians should never be sick and all this stuff, you know. And they go through all this, and what we do, we put condemnation up on people because we're not living up to a standard that they themselves cannot live up to. Amen? See, I stand with you whether you're poor, whether you're weak, whether you're sick, and I don't judge that as being God not forming in your life. Can you hear me? That's what Jesus said. I'm with you in all things. There's no place you can go without me. I'm with you in the enlightenment. I'm with you in the fire. And I'm with you in the dark times. Amen. How many of you know that the light can't come forth without the darkness? Have we not read Genesis? There wasn't light there. There was darkness there. Where did the light come from? The light come right out of darkness. That's what scripture says. God said that he's seen the earth with void. How many of you know that's us? He's seen us void and undone and broken. And he said his spirit began to hover over us. And he said out of the darkness he called forth the light. The light wasn't there. He called it out of the dark. Isn't that something? Amen. So the so the dark days of our lives are purposed. What are they purposed for? Bring balance. We got to have a balance. Amen. You know, you can't just have revelation, enlightenment. We got to have all four of these horses riding in us. And I promise you, if you're walking in the things of God, you will have all forces, hooves, prints all over you. <laughs> Amen. 
They will leave their stamp upon you. How many of you know that Paul said, I bear in my body the marks. There's a mark that is being put up on God's people today. And I, I, I preached about this in North Carolina, the seventh chapter after this chapter, about how that God told the angels to go to the four corners of the earth. I believe in that. I'm, I'm, I'm just getting off here just a little bit, but I, want, I think it's really essential. Told them to go to the four corners of the earth and to not let the wind blow up on the earth till the sealing of God's people was done. Now, the four corners at that time when scripture was written, probably most people in that day believed the earth was still flat. Right? At that time, they probably didn't know the earth was round. I mean, we're talking about in ancient days when this was written. Did you hear that? So, that part of it is relevant because what he's talking about is that the four corners covers the whole earth, whether it's flat or whether it's round. So it's irrelevant. What he's trying to tell us is that he has got the whole earth covered. Right? With messengers. Right? And the scripture says that the angel went forth and began to seal the people of God. Does anybody remember the scripture I told you to, to remember? 9 1 Isaiah. I told her to remember this because talks talks about it's Ezekiel, isn't it? Ezekiel 9 1. Ezekiel, how many of you know that, that you can find every one of these visions written? Ezekiel wrote about them. Ezekiel wrote about these horses. Zechariah wrote about them. All of them did. They seen the wheel within the wheel. The animal horse. All of this is taken from that. John's an old script, Old Testament scholar. So when these things are appearing to him, they're not strange to him. He's simply knowing that he has understood this in the natural, and now God is taking him into the spirit of it, and he's getting life from it. Oh, glory to God. What a time we live in. Amen? So God told him, said, the four corners, okay? He sends the messengers to Mark. In the scripture that I just quoted you in Ezekiel 9 and 1, it talks about that writer. He said, there was a man went out from God and had an inkhorn in his hand. And God told him to mark the people of God in their forehead. And this is what he said. He asked the messenger, he said, do you know how to mark the right ones? And God told him, this is who you mark. Those that is setting in the earth that is grieved and they are in constant prayer and they have not bowed the knee to this system that people says is all right. Can you hear me? They are not in agreement with the world. They are standing in agreement with God to say these things are wrong in the world and God is right. That is the true mark of God's people. Not someone that says everything goes, everything's okay. Can you hear what I'm saying? Everything is not okay for me. Everything is not okay for me to eat. Everything is not okay for me to participate in. That's the mark, true mark of God. That people will take a stand and will not compromise. Amen? Amen? The warrior, I mean, even Paul, in his wrongness, at least he stood for something. We have Christian people that don't know what they're standing for. You know, I say this about, oh, yeah, I work for that. You say this, oh, yeah, I work for that. I mean, one thing I can say about Paul, even when he was wrong, he stood. That's what kind of people God's after. Why? Because he knows when he reverses them, they're going to be standing in the right thing, and they're willing to die for it. Amen? Not compromise for it, but to die for it. It's easy for us to go out of here and say, hey, oh, that's okay, that's okay. Okay there, brother. Brother, bless you. Brother this, brother that. Can you hear what I'm saying to you? 
God don't brother me no more. Used to when I was a baby, he wrapped me in swaddling cloths and he gave me a little bit of milk and he was really kind to me and he treated me as my mother. But when he began to wean me from my mother, he brought me under the tutorship of a father and no longer is he winking at mine, he's busting my rear. We don't hear much of that, do we? <laughs> so, when you're under fathership, there's a different, God deals with you different. He deals with you as maturity, as sons of God. Amen? Not as children of God. And that's what I want to talk to you about. It's time for us to grow up. Amen? God will discipline you. <laughs> And he knows how to discipline you. He's got a belt that can reach far reaching than your natural father belt. <laughs> Amen? So we see that this brings balance. The night seasons in your life balances you. It lets you know that you can walk through the darkest night and still hear God's voice and be balanced in it. And know that if you stay there like Jacob, long enough, brother, the new breaking of a new day will happen in your life. And you will be touched in the holler of your thigh. Listen to me, people. God's not coming to keep us the same. Oh, glory. When Jacob woke up to that new day, he didn't walk the same, brother. Can you hear me? The hollow of his thigh had been touched and he got a new name. He had a new nature. And you know what the nature said? He that has the power of God now. Oh, glory to God. He has the power to live this life. Amen. Glory to God. We're coming to the last horse. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the four living creatures saying, come. I like that. I like when they say come because that's the correct pronunciation and that's in right context. He's calling this last horse forth in my life. Amen. How many of you have experienced these horses already? I have. I've experienced every one of them and still experiencing them. Amen? And I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death. And Hades was following close behind him. And they were given power over the fourth part of the earth to kill by a sword and famine and plagues and by the wild beast of the earth. Now this is really interesting and this is really where I want to get to. The word pale there is translated three words. It's chaos. I can't pronounce it. Don't, don't hold me to that pronunciation because that's what, that, that word there, Hebrew, one of them is Greek and I'm not very good at that. I do well to speak English in its proper form. But it's mentioned only three times in Scripture where it's used. And I've heard many different descriptions of it, but the way to find the truth to real Scripture is let the Scripture interpret itself. You can look at the definitions, and that's fine. But the true interpretation of Scripture is look the word up and follow it through Scriptures, and it's like a trail. It will tell you exactly what it means. Three times it's, it's, it's pronounced. Jesus Listen to this. This is really interesting. The horse, that colored horse was green. You can look it up in your Strong's. You can look it up in any different. It means green. It's a green horse. Now, death is setting on it. Really? How can death be setting on green? Confusion in there. Contradiction. No, it's not. It's in complete order. The first time it's mentioned is when Jesus is feeding the 5,000. And he tells them to go, remember? He's feeding the fishes and the loaves. 
And he goes and he tells them to go out and do what? Set up on the green grass. Amen? The second time it's mentioned, it's found, well, the next two times it's mentioned, it's mentioned in the book of Revelations. And this one I really like. John said that he's seen a rainbow around about the throne of God. Amen? And it was emerald color. It wasn't four colors. It was single. It was green. Representing what? Life. Amen? Representing the very life of God. And that's the covenant that we are under. Amen? So with that understanding, I get this understanding now. That death is setting on this green horse, this life horse is coming. Death is setting on it. I'm going to tell you what, everywhere life springs up, there is a death. Can you hear that? You cannot watch. Here's what Christianity's done. Here's what I've tried to do. I've tried to kill myself so that I could live. You know what I'm talking about. The natural mind. Trying to kill that sucker so what? I can live. But you know it's right the opposite? It's right backwards. It takes a life to bring a death. You know, we're real, we are well versed in the terminology of death. We can speak it, right? It's life that we have not got a hold of. But it's life that kills death. Totally destroys it. In the 8th chapter of the book of Romans, Paul says it this way. He says, The life that God has put in me has now destroyed the power of death and hell. He didn't say that death and hell destroyed him and he became alive. He said it was the very life that God put in him that brought him back to life. Amen? So isn't that great? So what do we need? We need more life, not death. Because in more life, we automatically die. You cannot come alive in God and not die to the other. I was telling my daughter this morning as we was talking, and it's very phenomenal. You know, rehabs. You know, my, my daughter's been to many of them. My, my daughter has come out and uh, went right back, 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 right back. Uh, more times than I can count. Yeah, she can teach you rehab. <laughs> Upside, sideways, and downs. She can teach it to you. Not, not knocking it, because it does have good principles. And the principles that it has, it separates you from that life. And they hope to keep you separated long enough that you get your mind back. Enough to know that you're killing yourself. That's the principle. Do you know that's the same principle in God and spirit? Because the more life we get separates us more from that other. So it's a good principle. You see what I'm saying? But the thing about being separated, if you don't separate unto God, you'll go right back. Because it's only God that can keep us in that separation. Amen? Oh, we may do it for a while. I know people that's done it for, for a long time. But without that spiritual life, there'll come a day that there it is again. Can you hear me? But in the spirit of the life of God is the only place that we can find true refuge, true living. Because as I was looking at that, as I was looking at that revelation in chapter where he put on the four corners, and I told my daughter this, you know, we as Christianity, we can accept the word coming. Listen, I can't take of the man's name. Uh, man, what was his name? One of them was Malcolm Smith, which is not the Malcolm Smith y'all was thinking about. But he's a, he, he's a dictionary, Smith Bible Dictionary. But the other one was, uh, I can't think of his name. But anyway, he wrote this, and he said that, uh, in ancient days, it was a history lesson. He said, in ancient days, am I getting out of the camera? 
probably. Sorry. You got to watch me. I'll move. In ancient days of, 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 of old Israelites, of the Israelites, the people of that land believed that when the wind blew out of the east and out of the north and out of the south and out of the west, it was a time of goodness. In other words, they could receive it. And it's good. Which is the norm. Most of us today, if the word's coming out of people that we trust and know, we accept it. But God is fixing to raise up a group of people that's go, the wind's going to blow horizontal. It's going to go cross grain. It ain't going to come the norm. Can you hear me? And if you're so in tune with the norm and thinking that's such a blessing, you're going to miss the word that's coming across. Because the word that's coming across is going to tear up every good crop you got in you. See, we as Christians or we as word people or what you want to call yourself it is, I don't really know what to call myself anymore. I'm unidentified. <laughs> Because by the time I think I'm something, God changes it. You see what I'm trying to say? But it's easy for us to accept those winds coming out of the norm. And it's easy for us to give up the things that we see that is of no good value. But what about when God begins to take those things in you that you hold truly value? See, that tree wasn't just evil. That tree was good. Now this is another thing. A lot of people think we're going back into the garden. That's great. And we think when we get back into the garden, everything's going to be lovely. Well, I got news for you. It was in the garden where sin came. <laughs> it was in the garden where death first arrived. It was in the garden where disobedience began. Can you hear me? So even though we go back into the garden, we still have to eat from the tree of life. Amen? So see, Adam and Eve didn't fall from the evil thing of the tree. Listen to what scripture says. I saw that it was good. How many things have we have let enter our life through religion through people that we trust, that we have thought was really good. Come on now with me. Come on. I'm going to tell you what, what God's going to do. He is going to take you to a place, and he's going to uproot everything in you, good, evil, or bad. To what well, Paul said, that there is nothing left in me but him. Yet not I. I is disappearing. Everything that identifies with I is going. To where what? There is nothing left. Amen? A lot of people today wants to ride on that white horse in the book of Revelations of 20. Don't they? I got news for you. You're not going to ride on the horse until the horse is written in you. You hear me? When the horse is written in you, then, why? Because we change natures. There's a mark in our forehead. There's an imprint. The, the scripture says that he imprinted it. It was imprinted. I'm sorry, Dale. I'm a bad, bad camera person. <laughs> yeah. But there's an imprint. Now listen, when John was seeing that revelation in chapter 7, this is what I loved about it. When you go from 6 to 7, there's still many more things in Revelation 6 that I'm not going to get to, not even going to touch. But in Revelation 7, when the revelation continues, because it is a progressive, ongoing revelation, John says, and he's sitting there, and he's looking at all these people. They have had the horses ridden in their lives now. They have been through the four winds, okay, of the messengers that sent by God. There's been a mark put up on them. And we realize that what qualified them for the mark was enduring 
these four winds. And I love the Jonathan. I know you like the Jonathan. I love the Jonathan in this seventh chapter. It says, when John asked, he said this. He said, but, but who are these? And they looked at him, and he said, these are they that has come out of great tribulation, great pressures, great winds, great trials. And Jonathan Mitchell says this, continuously coming. See, we, we just don't overcome something and sit down. When you overcome something, guess what? There's another hurdle sitting there waiting on you to get over. Amen? Because, see, we don't want to go halfway through this thing. We want to go all the way to where John's seen the new Jerusalem coming where? Inside of a people that has their lights open night and day and their gates are never shut, that we welcome all of creation. Amen? Whether we deem them good, bad, or ugly. <laughs> Sounds like a Clint Eastwood movie. <laughs> but we're open to them. And John looked at that and he said, and then I seen a great multitude that no man can number. And he said, who are these, Lord? And he said, this is the multitude that's come and continuously coming and continuously getting over it and coming through it. So what am I here to tell you today? It ain't over. You ain't done with trials. As Bob, we were sitting down in North Carolina, we just got back, had a tremendous meeting, and God really put a warning out to the people. He said, I want to tell you something right now. We are not entering a time of rest. We are entering a time of conflict. You know, when Jesus rode on that white horse in Revelation 7, he was warring. That white horse ain't come to bring peace in you. It's coming to war with all your passions, all your likes and dislikes. It is riding in you. And guess what? He has a company with him that has the same mind and it is of one accord. And if we are joined with that, that should be our purpose today. To look at creation and to look at our brothers and sisters and saying, look people, it ain't over. Health and well-being and prosperity is not the end of something. Can you hear what I'm saying to you? Don't get satisfied with those things. Those are only gifts. Them has nothing to do with changing natures. Amen? How many of you know that God blesses the just and the unjust? That's no big deal. And we run around and think we got a great message, a blessing. That's a carnal, natural message. What a man sows, shall he also reap? That's a law. That's children's stuff. Can you hear me? What God is bringing into a mature people that is able to stand in the midst of a people, look them in the eye, and tell them the truth. Amen? Not compromise with them. Look, if, I'm, if I got something going on in here, don't come to me and say, bless you, brother, it's going to be all right. Come to me and say, hey, bless you, brother, God's going to kill that thing. <laughs> Tell me the truth. It's the truth that makes me free, not lies. When God shows up in my life, something's going to change. Amen? And that's why with everybody. And that's like William Bob. Are you ready for the challenge? Because it's going to get tougher. I'm going to be honest with you. The fire is going to get hotter. Amen? I used to say this, Brandy. I said, if I could just get my daughter delivered, I'd be satisfied. And God said, that ain't what it's about. He said, you get your daughter delivered and you want to sit down. I said, he said, I, you ain't sitting down. He said, once that's done, there'll be something else coming because there's a work being done in you far deeper than just seeing things. It's becoming something. Amen? It's being able to stand up in congregations. Listen, it's easy for us to go and preach to people that believe like us. Go preach where they stand up in the pews and scream at you. 
and then see if you can truly preach this word. Amen? It's easy for me to come up here and minister to y'all because I know you're not going to jump up and scream at me. I've been in places, people, where they jumped up, screamed, walked out screaming. Say, I'm not coming in to compromise. I fear no man. You can't fear a man and preach this word because if you do, you'll compromise it. And I'll tell you what else you'll do to it. You'll speak just enough of it to butter it over in them. Water it down. That's what Brother Eby told me one time. He said, listen, I used to go to full man business, people's meetings. And he said, I used to, people wanted me to come. And Brother Eby, to me, is one of the most... He's the most prophetic writer that we have in our day. And this is what he said. He said, Dennis, he said, we got to go on. And said, oh, yeah, it was a blessing. He said, they wanted us to come because they wanted something from us. They wanted the life they felt from us. They wanted the life from the word they felt from us. And he said, the next thing you know, they'd take the essence of your message and re-preach it and add everything else to it. That's the reason he said, I quit going. He said, because I realized what they were doing. They wanted me to come. They wanted to hear these things. But then after I left, they watered it down so they could be popular among their people. And I said, what a truth. I'm going to tell you, when you preach this word, and you truly preach this word, the very essence of it, the very life of it, you are not going to be popular in the eyes of men. Because this message is not coming to satisfy the flesh. This message is coming to kill the flesh, that the spirit may live. Amen? And that's what I want to say to y'all today. Are you willing to pay the price? Because there's a price to walk this walk. And sometimes it's a lonely walk. Sometimes you don't have nobody with you. I walked this path for 10 years alone. I didn't have Gary. Gary was my friend for over 30 years, could not find me. Elwin Roach was my friend for over 30 years, could not find me. I'm going to tell you what, when God hides you, ain't nobody can find you. Amen? Nobody to talk to. Nobody to commune with. Ten years is a long time, people. I even sold all my suits. I had, I had nice suits. Don't wear suits no more. Don't like them. <laughs> Amen. Ain't got nothing again. If you won't wear them, fine. But I'm not. Even I, I got a bookshelves. I mean, a bookshelf full of true men of God. Some people you'd probably never heard of. Paul Mueller out of Oregon. Tremendous writer of God's word, like Preston and all of them. Ray Princeton, dead now, gone on to the other side. Gary Amrell, one of the true writers and exposed what hell really was, died, gone to the other side. Had all these men, I got a whole bookshelf full of them. I told my wife one day, I got up and I said, take all them books, my suits, and get rid of them. I'm done. I said, I ain't, I ain't going to preach again. Don't want to preach. Done. I no more than said that, and about a week later, God began to change things. <laughs> Thank God my wife didn't listen to me. She didn't throw nothing away. <laughs> See what I'm trying to say? God can put you in a place to where he can get your attention. Didn't want to preach this word. Definitely didn't want to travel. Guess who won that battle? Guess who won that war? Amen. And still fight today. I, I feel the lease of the kingdom. When I go and minister, I really don't want to minister. There's nothing in me that wants to minister anymore, Sammy. 
But when God quickens spirit in me, I can't keep my mouth shut. I begin to speak, and I speak forth what he says. Amen? And that's what I really want y'all to understand is God is getting a people, and he's drawing a line. And he said, this is it. And he's not blinking. He's not winking and blinking at our inabilities anymore. Can you hear that? He has got a mature body that he's maturing. Listen, in Revelations, in chapter 20, it said when the white horse come riding, he wasn't alone. So that tells me that God finished his process. Amen? That tells me that God won the battle. And the battle now is inside us. And we are not to compromise God anymore. And I believe that with all my heart. You know, even, even the love message, you know, it's got taken totally out of context. See, the love message today is God got to love you and not change you. You're okay, hon. That ain't the true message of love. The true message of love says this, that it will never quit. <laughs> In other words, that tells me that he's not going to quit. Till he gets what he wants. Not leave you there. Love don't leave you in that position. Love endureth all the way through it. If you read the definition of love, it's not compromising, it's changing things. And it stays there till it does change. Amen. See, God loved me enough not to leave me in that 10-year span that I'd found myself being comfortable in and was well ready to stay there. Amen? Now see, the, the love that most churches have anymore is that, well, brother, you're all right. You just stay right there. But see, God's love don't do that. God's love endures. It suffers long with you until he brings the change in you. He loves you to death. Let me put it that way. He'll love you till that thing in you dies. Amen? And he'll allow you in your life to go, whether it's in darkness, whether it's in deception, whether it's in evil. And when God gets through, it'll turn to good. My daughter had a real problem when she first because she'd been taught reconciliation her whole life. But what people does in reconciliation, they think that God's reconciliation says that he's going to just leave you like you are and you're reconciled. That's not the message of reconciliation. Amen? Reconciliation is that God reconciles everything in you, regenerates, renews, brings forth a new man. That's the true message of reconciliation. And he will do everything that he has put in this earth. How many of you know that everything put in this earth today was designed for his purpose? Whether it's evil, whether it's good. Most Christians can't get a hold of that. How many of you know that the devil, and boy, this is going on Facebook, and it'll get some people, the devil is a servant of God. He's not a free agent out there running around doing what he wants to do. And we learn that in Job and throughout Scripture. God asked the devil, he said, where you been walking to and fro in the earth? See, he couldn't touch Job. It was God that brought Job's attention to the enemy. Why? Because Job had some things that had to be worked out. And listen, Job, listen, to I love this part. It said that Job was prosperous. God blessed him more than anybody in the land. Isn't that something? Think about that a minute. And all of a sudden God said, I'm fixing to rip that thing out of him. Can you hear that? Have you considered him? Yeah, but God, he said, this God, devil talking to God. Yeah, but you got a hedge around him. I can't touch him. He said, I'm going to drop it. I'm going to drop the hedge. God dropped the hedge and the devil, the first thing he does is starts taking, taking, taking. Listen to this. Everything that Job had, 
God had given him. That's what I'm trying to tell y'all. Everything that job, everything that he had, God gave him. The scripture plainly says that, right? Now it's being taken. 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 And taken. And I've heard some people and some preachers even, man, it just it makes me sick at my stomach. But say, well, Job just wasn't right in his faith. He wasn't right in his confession. And all of a sudden, I read the scripture and God pointed it to me. When his wife, his soul, because that's what I reckon the wife to. You know, the wife is a weaker vessel. It's not a me and her weaker. It's talking about the soul in a man. The woman was brought out of the man. The soul is out of the man. You're the man. you got a soul, spirit, and body. Is that okay to say that? Okay. So we see that. So I'm not talking about gender. Because in God there is no gender. Amen? So all of a sudden the woman said, after everything's being taken, don't this sound like your soul? Curse God and die. Now, I heard a lot of people say, well, Job wasn't right in his faith. He wasn't right in his confession. And then you know what the next scripture says after that? He said, in all, and this is what he said, God giveth and God taketh away. And that's when the woman told him to curse him and die. And then right behind that, it said, in all that Job said, he did not accuse God falsely. He knew who was loose in his life. Isn't that amazing? So it was all taken. Why was it all taken? First, the natural. Listen to me, people. This is really important. We first come into a natural understanding with God. Right? God blesses us with natural things. Nothing wrong with that. It's wrong with it when we think that's all of God, though. Amen? The scripture says plainly, you must first understand the natural and then the spiritual. Listen, Job's children was taken, his houses were taken, his cattle were taken. Now, us liking that. God had blessed him with all of this knowledge, this understanding. Think about it in doctrinal sense. God has given him great understanding about him in the natural. He even has produced children in the natural realm with these doctrines and teachings. Have we not all taught and produced children after ourselves with the things that we teach and believe? Right? Now all of a sudden God is taking them all away. You know what Job says? Listen to these horses. These horses is riding in Job's life. Every one of them. Now listen to what Job says. He said, I curse the day that I was born. And the enemy comes back again and he says this. He said, skin for skin and flesh for flesh and he'll curse you. And God, at that point, God hadn't let him touch his body. But now God says, touch him. I sometimes, Clifton, I think God's got more faith in me than me. Kind of like Job, you know. All of a sudden, the, the enemy touches his body. The, the scripture says that Job had sores and sickness all over him. Surely this can't be God. Said that he set himself in a pile of ashes and took a scratcher and trying to scratch these things. This man was miserable. Can you hear me? What would the church today, if they'd see somebody pronouncing that they have a true word from God and see that in their lives, how would we judge that? Are you hearing what I'm saying about judging? How would we judge that type of action? Charlotte, my dear friend, my dear mother and spirit and Bob. Charlotte was sick her whole life. Can you hear me? Wrote thousands of songs out of the spirit that we hadn't even begun to get the hold of what she, the essence of what she was writing. 
And most of it was laying on a sick bed. Can you hear that? Most people wouldn't have nothing to do with her because they thought if she was truly doing what God wanted her to do, she would not be in that shape. Wow. There was times that they'd have to carry her into a meeting. And under the anointing, God would raise her up out of the bed and begin to speak. And as soon as the anointing left, she'd go right back down. This was in her entire life, people. All them songs that Bob and Gary sing, you'll hear some next Sunday. They're all her songs. And you know what? She could have easily wrote songs of misery, death, and complaining. But every song that she sung is a song of life. Oh, glory to God. And all of a sudden we see that same thing in Job's life. Because, see, God is taking away the first to establish the second. So everything of this order that we've been blessed in will be taken. Can you hear me? Job is a beautiful picture of sonship. Most people want to tear the book of Job out. I've had preachers that tell me, oh, that book shouldn't have never been in there. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Why? Because it does not agree with their doctrine. Amen? But if you understand what God's doing in Job's life, he's taken away the natural, and what it's established forever is the spirit. They said, listen to this, I love this part. All of a sudden, Job, he went through his religious friends. Oh, his religious friends tore him up. <laughs> yeah, they come to him and say, well, listen, if you was truly of God, all this wouldn't be happening to you. Yeah, what have you done wrong? I mean, haven't you got, all got friends like that? <laughs> all of a sudden, God begins to turn Job around. And God shows up on the scene. I think this is in about the 20-something. Don't, don't quote me on it. You just have to look it up by what I'm saying. Job begins to hear God. And as he's sitting there, God said, Job, what are you doing? I'm just paraphrasing. And Job looked up. He couldn't say a word. And Job said, and God said this, Declare unto me, Job, where were you at when the morning stars sang together and the stars were being formed and the earth was coming forth? Where were you at? And I heard a lot of people say that God was condemning Job. No, God was commissioning Job. What God was telling Job was, declare unto me who you were in the beginning. Come forth and begin to speak. And Job became, began to come forward and talk about his beginnings. And it said, God blessed the latter end of Job seven times more than he blessed the beginning. So what did he do? He moved out of the natural into the spirit, which was the realness of what he really was. And he says that the things that he produced out of that life, people desired it. And even the people that criticized him came to him and asked them to pray for him for forgiveness because they seen how wrong they had been about what the man had went through. Amen. There's going to be a lot of repenting in the days ahead of how we judge what people's gone through. Amen. A lot of repenting. Amen. Can you hear me? Every one of y'all's lives sitting here was direct divined of God. And no matter where you went, God purposed it. Amen? He allowed it. Not that you stay there, but you learn something and come forth. Amen? That you begin to come forth in the things of God. And that's what I want to say to you all today. 
begin to come forth into the things of the Lord. Amen? In the days ahead, I'm going to tell you right now, there is going to become trials greater than the ones that you went through right now. They're not going to stop. Because the scripture says that they are continuously coming out of them. Also, when it talks about the overcomer getting the new name written in a white stone in the head, it said, these are they that has overcome. The scripture goes farther. It says, continuously coming over. It ain't something that we just overcome and that's it. Something that we are continuously coming over. Continuously coming through. Continuously moving forward into the things of God. Amen? So, how do we separate? What separates us? You want separated from things? Get more life. It's the life that separates us. Not the death. It's the life. Amen? It's the life that separates us from all other things. Amen? And I want to tell you, in the days ahead, fear no man. That's the word that God's really putting in my spirit. Fear not man. And the man you've got to overcome is in you. Because it's a man in you that compromises the word of God. You'll say, well, I better not speak that. I might hurt. Can't do that. You cannot fear this voice in you. You've got to speak what God. It's time. It's the day of the Lord. Amen? You know what? I've said this over and over again. Thank God that there is men that has paid the price that I truly can hear this word to. Amen. There isn't a man that I know, Clifton, that has preached this word that has not been kicked out of every denomination, every church system, and every organization. And I want to say this with this purpose. Jesus was never born in the church. Did you hear that? He was born in the stable. In the stalls of animals. He was born in humanity. Outside the gate. He was crucified outside. He was born outside. And I want to say something else about his birth. His birth brought trouble. Did you hear that? His birth wasn't peace. It brought trouble. Read about Mary's life. From the time that God pronounced him being born in her, trouble. She had to leave her own home. She was an outcast. Right? Joseph, when Christ was born, brought tribulation in his life. He had to move and marry into a different part of the country. Jesus being born is going to bring trouble. Christ being born in you is going to bring trouble. He even brought trouble to Herod. Herod even tried to kill the birth. It brought trouble to the whole nation. It said that they were in the streets moaning and crying because he went out and tried to kill the man child. Do you know we're not living in the same day? Look at the man child they're trying to kill. Same deal. When the Christ is born, there's trouble. <laughs> Amen? And that's what I want you to be aware of. It's time for us to quit candy coating this thing. I don't get free by you lying to me. I get free by you telling me the truth. Huh? I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you the truth. There is trying times ahead. For every one of us. There's going to be some hard things on our flesh. Hard things coming on our flesh. Amen? But the end result is life. You know, that's hard to see when you're encompassed with so much of your flesh dying. Isn't it? It really is. But with every night, just like Jacob wrestling in that night. Jacob wasn't, he wasn't, he was wrestling. It wasn't a night of peace and calm. He was wrestling. The scripture said he wrestled till the breaking of the new day. 
We are going to wrestle till a new day breaks. And when the day breaks, our character and our nature will change and we will not walk the same anymore. Amen. How do you tell the people of God? They walk with a bad limp. They got marks in their bodies. The proof of their apostleship is marked in them. Can you hear that? I like what Isaiah, his description of the Christ. You know, everybody wants to have a description. Let me read Isaiah's description of him. He said, there's nothing in him that you would desire. Think about that a minute. This is Isaiah's description of him. There is nothing in him that you would desire. There is nothing in here that this old man desires. You know why? Because he's come to kill this old man. That's the reason they don't desire him. Amen? Sometimes you ought to just go read that inscription of what Isaiah described him at. But that's the truth about him. Because he didn't come to bring peace. It said that he come to set mother against father, daughters against sons. You know what I'm saying? He has come to do what? <laughs> bring us life. No. Bring us life. <laughs> Guilty. Guilty by association. <laughs> no, he's come to bring life. So if he comes to bring life, it's opposite of death. And all we've been raised up is the death room. And when that's, have you ever noticed how hard we fight for death? <laughs> One time I was, boy, I was arguing with God so bad about something, and he said, why are you so insistent on staying in death? It really got my attention. And I realized my arguing was for death, not life. And it was something I didn't want to let go of. Amen? Wouldn't it be nice if we could just get these concepts in our head and that's all to be to it? But we are fleshly people. When God cuts away flesh, it hurts. As I told one people, I said, listen, you can say all you want to, but when I walk up and bend your finger over and it breaks, it hurts. That's a prime example of when God cuts the flesh away from us. It hurts because it's part of us. Amen? But the greatest separation that God is separating within us is this. He's separating us. For the more life we get, the more we separate from the old nature. So you want to separate from the old nature, get more life. Because the more of him increases, the less of you there is. And that's what we're after. Amen? Amen. I hope this hasn't been too hard on you. I hope, it's, I hope it brings truth to you and understanding. Always allow judgment in your life. I don't care if it's from outside or what. I open you up. Judge me. Judge my word. Judge what I preach. It's open. Amen. You know, it's in that judgment that I find the right way. And without that judgment, I cannot find the right way. So I welcome God's judgment in my life, your judgment, and you should always judge a message that's coming to you, whether it's flesh or whether it's spirit. And it's pretty easy to tell when it's once you get into the spirit of things. Pretty easy to tell. It's like night and day, really. It really is. Amen? Amen. It's been an honor again to speak with you. I haven't been up here in a while. But... Uh, God has God has really began to move in a people. There's a people that really is moving into the things of God. People that we're not aware of. People that God has had hidden away that nobody knows about is beginning to come forth into what God is doing and hearing what God is saying. And they are beginning to come together. And it's it's not it's not that they're coming together under one building, one sound, one voice, but you can just hear the sound in the land. How many of you can really hear the sound, the turn? I don't know about y'all, but over the last few months, I have really heard a sound in the earth that is changing things, that's really coming forth and changing things. 
Amen? Amen. God bless y'all. Cliff, I'm done.